start? Why don't you go for it right now? Is your mic on? Test. I'm Bob Darrell. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Bob. I want to talk about a couple of men's that some some of you may identify with. Uh, one of the when I first got sober, uh, I had done so much damage with my mother and father that we hadn't talked in quite a while, and they would not take my calls anymore. Uh, I and I know I called from a county jail, and when the operator asked him to take the calls, they hung up. Uh, they wouldn't. They wouldn't help me anymore. I was not welcome in their house, and it wasn't that my parents didn't love me. I had just broke their heart repeatedly, over and over and over and over again. And my, they were able to physically cut me out of their life, but they could never emotionally cut me out of their heart. So consequently, my mother saw a therapist and took medication, and my father slept 15 hours, 16 hours a day. And I did that to them. And I had really hurt their life. I almost destroyed their marriage. Um, my, it was I stole so much before my parents cut me out of their life. I so, stole so much from my father that he became, eventually became friends with the guy who owned the pawn shop in our town from buying his own stuff back. And then when he became friends with the guy, the guy wouldn't take, he wouldn't buy nothing from me no more. And, uh, and I did that to them. And when I get sober, people in AA are telling me that I need to make amends to my parents. And I, I understand, I'm not dumb. I understand what they're trying to say. But, see, they don't understand that it's too late for that. And I am very grateful that the people in Alcoholics Anonymous never gave much credence to my opinion of things. And they just gave me actions to take that I didn't believe in or believed would work. And uh, first thing, first action they gave me, they told me to start calling my mother and don't call collect. I remember the first time I called my mom, I called and I, I, she answers the phone. I say, Mom, how you doing? And she says, she says, are you in Pennsylvania? I said, no, I'm, I'm in Nevada. Well, the, the operator didn't come on and ask me to pay for the call. I said, no, Mom, I paid for the call. And her voice shot up an octave. She went, you paid for the call? She couldn't believe it. I had always called collect. It was like I had some kind of sick sense of entitlement, right, with my parents. I used them. I had that, that all that stuff going on. And, I, and, and she did not receive my call well. It was kind of like, what do you want? And I... Um, I was told to start sending my mom and dad cards, call every week, pay for the call. Don't ever miss a anniversary, a birthday, a Mother's Day, a Father's Day, a Christmas. Take the, I wasn't making much money. I had a little job making minimum wage, and I, had to, I would buy cards, and I would send them to them. And, and I did that for a year regularly. And I did it, and they rejected me through the whole year. They weren't warm. They didn't warm up to me. And when you think of it objectively, after all I put my parents to through, for them to warm up to me easily, there'd be something wrong with their mental health. After all I did to them. And when I was about a year sober, they decided to come out to Las Vegas and, and eyeball me. And they they came out to Las Vegas with this attitude. You know, he's probably still a bum trying to con us. But, you know, we've never been to Vegas. It won't be a total loss if we go out there and he's a bum, right? <laughs> so they came out to Las Vegas with that attitude, really. And, and I met him at the airport, and I took him out to dinner with my sponsor and his wife and took him to my home group, and they got to see me uh, with, uh, with you. And I've never been better. And they couldn't have seen me anywhere better than at my home group. And uh, they got to see me with the, around the old timers who used to pick on us and make fun of us. And then uh, the guys I was trying to help, the newer people, I pick on them because it's Alcoholics Anonymous works on the first rule of plumbing: crap runs downhill. Um, 
and they got to see me with the guys I run around with, and I was taking meetings into a detox in a, um, a halfway house, and the guys I run around with to do that. And, and they saw the laughter, and they saw the, the emotion and the sincerity and the genuineness of Alcoholics Anonymous. They didn't understand it, but they liked what they saw. And I took them. They went to a meeting with me just about every night, I think, that they were there. And they, they loved AA. And uh, right before they were to go back to Pennsylvania, I met them in the coffee shop of the Stardust where they were staying. I had my thing all fixed out. With uh, I owed my dad a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. I'm, I mean, this is was years of, of having fines, and if I don't pay him, I'm going to go to jail, and he'd loan me the money. Years of not having the rent, and if I don't, I'm going to be thrown in the streets, so he'd give me enough money. Years of transmissions going out in cars, and I can't, I need the car fixed to go to work, and he'd loan me the money. And I never paid him back a dime. And I sit, I sat down. I figured it up to the best of my ability. And it was going to take uh, 12 and a half years of payments to make it right. It was a lot of money. And I sat down in the co coffee shop with him with my game plan. I was going to start making payments. And he looked at my mom. And then he said to me, he said, kind of smiled at each other. And my dad said to me, he says, look, Rob, we don't want you to pay the money. We... Uh, are delighted that you're sober. This is the first time in years that we had any hope you're going to be okay. We don't understand this or anything, but just keep going to it. It's done something good for you. Keep hanging around with those people and just stay sober and forget about the money. Well, I just got out of 12 and a half years of payments. I mean, I just hit the a, the recovery lottery. And, man, I'm delighted. And I, I'm... I'm leaving there to go over to my sponsor's office to tell him the good news, man, and I'm just excited. I'm thinking about other people I owe money to, how I could convince them to see the light like my parents <laughs> did. <laughs> we over there, and I get to my sponsor's office. I tell him the good news. My dad said I didn't have to pay him, and my sponsor said to me, it doesn't matter. It's your debt. You have. To, it's your integrity. It's your debt. You have to make this right. And I thought, what are you talking to my dad I, there's no way to do it. There's no way. If I send my father a little check every month, he's not going to – he's probably not going to cash it. Won't, he doesn't need the money really. I didn't know what to do. And my sponsor just said, I believe if you're willing, God will show you a way. And the universe started moving around. And I was working as a cashier in a store and uh, – I got an inspiration one day, and it was just a thought. Sometimes inspiration is really from God is silly little thoughts you don't give much credence to until you start acting on them and you realize they're life-changing. And I, the little thought was, well, you know, I, I run this cash register, and this is in the late 70s. Every single day uh, we would get uh, silver coins, uh, wheat pennies, war nickels, uh, silver certificates, gold certificates. There was still a lot of that stuff, silver half dollars. A lot of that stuff was still in circulation. And every day some of that would come through those registers. And I thought my dad has one hobby that he's – it's almost an obsessive hobby. He's really into it. He collects those kind of coins, all that stuff. He'd sit for hours at the kitchen table with that stuff. It almost – it was like his deal. And I thought, you know – Maybe if I, I would talk to my boss and maybe I could start buying this stuff and putting it aside, never imagining that I could cure the whole debt. I mean, that would be too much. But maybe I could one day give a bunch, like, you know, some of it, $1,000 worth of coins and stuff to my dad or something like that, you know. And I talked to my boss and he said, fine. And I started moving along that line. And uh, it's a funny thing when you start moving towards towards God's will for you, the universe becomes a very accommodating place. And some synchronistic things started happening. One is I, I started getting raises and bonuses. There was a guy in AA that had a moving business. He used to pay me 100 bucks cash just for a couple hours' work moving furniture. And I'm, it was amazing, but in about four years or so, I saved up at face value the entire debt. In, in silver coins and gold certificates, silver certificates. I, there was a couple times $100 bills would come through, the old gold certificates, and I'd have to stick it away, and it might take me almost a month to get the money to actually buy it from my boss's safe. 
And at four years, I took all that stuff and I was able to give it to my father. He came out to Vegas and I gave it all to him. And uh, he had a hard time getting it back on the plane, actually. Uh, it was a bags of stuff. And, um, it had to, I think it cost him about 100 probably. I don't know. It cost him a bunch to get it back. And um, when I gave him that, something changed. Now, I've been communicating with my father and mother by this time uh like weekly or bi-weekly for several years. There was no doubt in my mind prior to paying my dad that, giving my dad that money, there was no doubt in my mind that my dad forgave me and there was no doubt in my mind my dad loved me. When I gave him that money for the first time in my life, my dad started to respect me. I think I became a man in his eyes. I think prior to that he loved me, but I was Bob. You know Bob. Got to make allowances for Bob, right? I was I was that guy. I was the guy that yeah we love Bob, but you know he's Bob. And when I gave my dad that money, I I think I I, I earned his respect. There's an old saying around AA that you you sell out your own integrity and self respect a nickel and a dime at a time, and you buy it back a nickel and a dime at a time. And amends are not made in a like amends don't work sometimes like four shots of tequila. Sometimes you pay and you pay and you just chip away at this stuff and you chip away and you chip away. Um, my dad died that next year and I was able to fly back to Pennsylvania and be there for my mother and sister. And, and uh, something started happening that was just crazy. I was the black sheep of the, sheep of the family and I became the pillar. And my whole family eventually moved to Las Vegas to be around me. Right? Amazing. And I was the outcast. The power of God is strong. And I didn't do any of that. I, I just did what people in AA told me to do. I'll tell you one, one more amends, and it was probably one of the most difficult ones I ever had to make. And the reason it was difficult, it was for something I did sober. And, you, you know, for... The stuff you do when you're drinking, there's a little self-exoneration in the fact that, well, I was drunk. I mean, you know, I was messed up. I wasn't sober yet. You know, you, you kind of you get yourself a little bit of relief by hanging it on that hook. But what do you do about the stuff that's, that's kind of slimy that you did as a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous? When I was about, uh, when I was early in sobriety, I was working, uh, as, as I said, I was working as a cashier in this store and uh, I I smoked. I had a heavy, heavy nicotine addiction. I was I was better than three packs a day. I would light cigarettes off cigarettes. I was that guy. And I, I went through a lot of cigarettes and and I was struggling trying to make some amends and I was tr struggling trying to get by just to pay rent. I was not making very much money at the time when I first started doing that. And one Thursday I ran out of cigarettes in the middle of my shift, and I'm broke until the next day, Friday, when I get my paycheck. And so uh, one of the things we sold in the store was cigarettes. So I, I thought to myself, that's usually the way I do it. I thought to myself, well, <laughs> I'll take a pack of cigarettes, and then tomorrow when I get my paycheck, I'll cash it like we usually do at the work there in the, out of the register, and then I'll ring it up. It seemed like a reasonable proposition. Not stealing. I'm just. I'm just going to take borrow this pack of cigarettes. I'll pay for it tomorrow when I get my paycheck. Well, tomorrow came and I got my paycheck and I cashed it out of the register. And the thought goes through my mind. You know, you need to ring up those cigarettes. And immediately I thought. I thought to myself. You know. I come early. I wait. I stay late. I work harder than anybody else here. I I mean, for God's sakes, it's only a pack of cigarettes. Everybody does some of this stuff. It's probably factored into the cost of operation. <laughs> and I never rang those cigarettes up. And from that moment on, I don't think I bought another pack of cigarettes. And I started stealing all my cigarettes out of there. And then, one, you know, you know how that is, man. Once you roll down that road and you got that door open, next thing I know, I'm, I'm taking a six-pack of Diet Coke, right? In the realm of the spirit, uh, when you get sick, you don't initially get 
the connection to your actions and how you're starting to feel and your experience in life. Sometimes in the realm of the spirit, you do something over here and you start, you don't initially get sick over there. Sometimes you get sick over here and then over there and then eventually it shows up here too. And I started getting real sick and I don't know what's wrong with me. But I start going to meetings and it seemed like people were just irritating me in AA. It seemed like everybody was phony. Everybody was just trying to be something they weren't. You know what I mean? Everybody was a liar in AA. Now, I don't understand that I'm projecting sort of this judgment of myself on these people because I'm the guy that's doing that, really. But I started judging my way right out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was dating a girl at the time, and I started to pick her apart. I started to get depressed at times. I started to get... uh, anxious about stuff you know that those nameless fears that you just you ever like wake up with just a feeling of apprehension and you can't you can't say what you, you don't can't really put your finger on what you're afraid of but i'm afraid a lot i'm anxious a lot free-floating anxiety and i was starting to get some of that again and and then eventually I started picking my boss apart. And the guy I worked for was a good guy. I mean, he never mistreated me. He was really a good man. And, and I, started, but I started picking him apart the way we can do. You know, you get that mindset. You could pick apart Mother Teresa with the right mind, alcoholic mindset. <laughs> and I started doing that to him. And I'm getting sicker and sicker and more and more into my head. And, and the emotions are more and more wacky and one night I get down on my knees to, to thank God for that day of sobriety as I've been structured and, and taught to do. And on my knees in this little apartment, I yelled out something. I, and I just yelled out, God, what the hell's going on? The minute, the moment I asked the question in my pit of my stomach, I knew the answer. I knew what was happening. I just, it was like, it was just like that clarity. The reason I'm getting so sick here and I'm on my way to drinking again is because I'm stealing from my boss. I'm a liar, I'm a cheat, and I'm a thief. And I'm trying to pretend and misrepresent myself as some kind of honest member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've become the guy it talks about in the beginning of the chapter into action who leads the double life. That I want to have a certain reputation. I want people to think I am and secretly inside myself I know what I am. And I'm on my way to drinking again. And I, it's in all of this, it just became so clear to me and it scared me. And I, I started figuring out what it was, how much, and I'd been stealing for a long time by now. And it just overwhelmed me. It was a lot of money. And I don't have the money. And I'm going to have to go to my boss and I'm going to have to tell him what happened. And he has zero tolerance for employee theft. I mean, and in retail, that's the way it is. He has zero to- I'm going to lose my job. He's going to throw me out of the store. I watched him do that. I watched him really get angry at a guy and throw him out. I um, hope he doesn't prosecute me. I'm going to, I don't have the money to pay him. I'm going to have to try to get another job. Now i get another another void on my resume, and I had a bunch of voids that are kind of hard to explain where I didn't work for long periods of time. And I got another one I can't talk about or I'm afraid to tell people that he's going to check with him. Because they're going to say, don't hire him. He's a thief. And the worst part of all, I think, was was the guy that I, I had to go face had heard me ramble on about my rigorous program of honesty in AA. I couldn't stand myself. And sometimes great things come from a place you get to where you get to that point you can't stand yourself. And I went and talked to him, and I told him what had happened, and he did not take it well. He started yelling at me, and I just stood there and took it because I knew I owed it. I deserved it. And he didn't fire me. Surprised me. He did not fire me. And so I made up my mind. I told him I will pay back every cent of this, and I figured out to the best of my ability the amount. Then I added on another 10%, and then I added on another $50. And the reason I did that is I know how I am. If I'm going to misjudge the amount, it's probably not going to be in his favor. <laughs> right? You know, and I was at a point where I wanted to be free of this so desperately, I would rather over, I would chance overpaying it and get clean in here than to screw around here and might miss it the other way. And I started making payments on this, on this guy. And within no time at all, man, I liked working there again. 
Within no time at all, I'm, I'm doing good. The book says in the Ninth Step Promise will be amazed before we're halfway through. And I started paying this back. And uh, oddly enough, within 30 days of my making the last payment, about 30 days after that, I was not looking for another job. I was very happy there. A guy came to me and offered me a job with an opportunity for management in another, in a simple related business. And it was more, much more, considerably more money. And I, I said, yeah, absolutely. And I put my notice in and I went to work for this new guy and I never stole a dime from him, never even took home a ballpoint pen. And uh, I did what Ch Chuck Chamberlain had taught me. I went to work for one reason and one reason only, and that was to help God's kids. I went to work trying to forget about myself and think about the customers and the other employees to be of service. And in no time at all, I was running that joint. I was getting bonuses. I was making a lot more money, which was helping me facilitate other amends. After a while, I, I'm, at the, I'm at a restaurant, a Denny's restaurant one night, and I run into the guy I'd stolen from and paid back, the guy, my old boss, and he's there with his wife. And I, I started talking to him. I said, yeah, how you doing? He said, well, he said, I'm, I'm not doing that. He says, I'm all right, I guess, but I'm kind of a little disappointed. I, you may have heard I was going to sell, sell my store. I said, yeah, I'd heard something about that. And he said, well, it fell through because of the slot machines and everything. The guy couldn't get a pass the licensing investigation. And he said, I, I thought I was going to be able to retire and get free. And I got it back in my lap again. And he said, I guess it's just not the cards for right now. Maybe I'll find something. Something else will happen. And I had an out-of-body experience. I stood there and I heard myself say to him, it was embarrassing, I heard myself say to him, oh man, I'd like to buy your store. The minute I heard the words come out of my mouth, I started backpedaling. I was, I was embarrassed. I, then I went, oh, I, I don't know why I said that. I don't have any money. I'm just kidding. And, and I, was, I couldn't believe I said it. And he he's asked me some questions. And one of them was, what, what's your day off? And I told him, he said, meet me here. And I remember walking into the Denny's, and he's sitting in a booth, and he's got these papers laid out on the booth next to him. And he, I sit down across from him, and he makes me a proposition. He says, uh, he said, if you put your notice in and come back and work for me and run my business, he said, it's not doing very well right now. Or the guy's kind of running into the ground that I thought I was selling it to because he took it over for a while, and he's not doing very well. But if you can get it back to where it's rocking and rolling again, up, get the numbers up, and it's profitable, out of those profits, you will get – 10% of the business every year. At the end of five years, he says, I'm out of here. Let the business make a few payments after that, and we're done. Now, I'm a guy with no education. I'm a guy whose resume includes telemarketing, selling blood, selling drugs, <laughs> digging ditches and washing dishes and running a cash register. I mean, this is beyond anything I could have imagined. And I said, absolutely. And I went, I started running that joint and I started doing everything AA told me to do. And when I took that business over, it was doing about 600000 a year. And I started opening other stores and expanding the business out in other areas. And I think at one point we were doing almost $10 million. And I bought and ended up owning all the real estate that came with the company and the, and the commercial properties. And I sold that company about five or six years ago, and I was able to retire very well. And with the financial freedom that gave me the ability to do things I've always wanted to do, I'm uh, singing and playing with a blues band, and I'm writing music, and I'm producing TV shows, and I'm, I'm doing, and I'm doing this for fun. And it may turn out to be very profitable. It may not. It doesn't matter. I'm just doing it because it lights me up, and I like the way I feel when I do it. And I think I stood at a turning point in a, in a cheap little 200 and some dollar a month apartment in Las Vegas where I could have went right or left. Right, maybe I would have drank, I don't know. But I went left. And I, I bit the bullet and I walked through the fear and I made the amends. And it changed my life. And I didn't, I didn't expect that. All I did want to do was I just didn't, I wanted to get this thing off of me. And it was on me. And it was on me bad. And I wanted to get free of it. And sometimes, sometimes the hardest amends to make are the ones that are, where the fear is the greatest. 
I, I have guys come to me a lot who are sober 15, 20 years, 25 years, even longer sometimes, and they're financial disaster areas. And they, some of them have really good jobs, and the more money they make, the more in debt they become, right? And they just burn their life to the ground financially, and they don't know what's wrong. And they come to me for, for weird motives because they see the 12-cylinder the Mercedes in the house and all that stuff, right? And they think I'm going to teach them some kind of financial trick or something, you know, like some kind of voodoo thing. And, and to this day, every single case, we always find there's unmade financial amends that keep them stuck. Maybe there are men's where they got away with it because the person didn't want to, wanted to be a nice guy and say, oh, just forget about it. You don't have to pay me, but it never changed the thing in here. Or our people they'd hurt and ripped off and they never knew that they ripped them off. They think they got away with it. The problem is, you know how it is. We never get away with anything because the one person, the worst person that could ever know you did it knows you did it and that's you. That's the problem. That's the worst person that could ever know you did it is you. And you can't escape you. And that's the problem. You can't escape you. And the God within me always knows what I am because it's he's more of me than I am. And so we start to we start to do this to clean this stuff up and I've watched guys lives just turn right around. Page I'll, I'll, this and I'll turn it back over to Scott. Page 127 is a is a statement of spiritual cause and effect. It's it's almost a promise. And I think it has a lot of relevance for those of us who have lived in a lot of financial insecurity and fear and anxiety about material stuff and money. Right dead in the center of the page, it says, although financial recovery is on the way for many of us, we found we could not place money first. We must place spiritual principles first. For us, material well-being always followed spiritual progress. It never preceded it. Now, I know a guy, I, I, know, I know several people, actually, that have been sober a fair amount of years and have made millions and millions of dollars. And i got to tell you something. They have no material well-being. They're driven, anxious, uptight people about money. And they have more than they'd ever need, and it's never enough, and they can never have enough, and they're, they're just uh, the most miserable people when it comes to that. They never enjoy one dime of it. I know other guys that make very little bit of money, but they've, they've sacrificed and they've paid back all their debt, and they're, they have more, an amazing level of fi material and financial well-being because they know that they're free now and they know that there's nothing inhibiting them from, from receiving God's grace. There's a promise in the third step, and it says we have a new employer and being all-powerful, Remember, there is one who has all power, and if there's one who has all power, that means you don't got any because there ain't none left. There's one who has all power. And there's being all powerful, he will provide what we needed if we can do two things. If I can keep close to him and perform his work well. And keeping close to him means I have to clear away the stuff between me and God. I have to make the amends. I have to, I have to jettison the, the things that the defects and the judgments and the aspects of self that are between me and God. And I have to help his kids. Because it, if you read this book over and over again, the, the spirit, the, 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 the absolute default position in the realm of the spirit is always the same thing. We turn our attention to, to who we can help. We turn our thoughts to who we can help. I mean, you don't have to read this book and be a rocket scientist before you get from just the repetitiveness of it that that's the point, is to help God's kids. So if I can try to stay close to him and turn my consciousness towards him on a regular basis and try to help his kids, I will never, ever, ever need for anything. And God knows more about what I need than I do. I'm telling you. I would never have designed the life I have. I would have shortchanged myself. God knows more about what's good, what's going to light me up and make me good in here than I would ever imagine. Scott, thanks, Bob. Right. I love those right. stories and that fabulous right. stuff. Right. Man, uh, two things I want to remind you again: we're going to start at eight thirty in the morning. The schedule says nine. 
Uh, and the second one is the meditation workshop following what Bob and I are going to do tomorrow morning. My wife and I are going to split that. Uh, as those of you who are here today know, she has a tremendous gift for guided imagery. She's going to talk a lot about meditation. She's going to read some al literature. I'm going to read from the 12 and 12. And we're going to do another guided imagery. And it's the it's one that sh- uh, the only way I know how to tell you is it showed up at our first men's retreat. It's not like we wrote it, but it appeared. And it's one of the most spectacular things that ever happened to me, and I use it daily now. Um, so anyway, a little plug for that. I go back to uh, talking about step nine for a minute. On this letter thing, my experience has been that it's about crying. When you're making amends to somebody that's dead, if you can't cry, you probably won't get free. And if you write and cry, you compress the process and you don't get it done. Those of you who picked up these handouts, know if you've read them, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if, if you don't, if you want one, you're sure welcome to it. Um, Maybe come up and get them after this session. But it can take more than one letter, and that information's down there. My email address is at the end of it. I'm more than happy to talk to you. Um, this is a gift from my home group. We say you take your problems to your sponsor and you bring your solutions to your meeting. Um, that, and that has really improved the quality of the meetings in my home group. Is we don't, you know, I've been on the one, anybody get a problem, the newest newcomer dumps his bucket, the next eight newcomers tell him how to fix his life. I don't want to listen to that anymore. And so that's, that's why we evolved into what we did. In Ninth Step, it says a new freedom. A new freedom. The old freedom, was Bob talks about four shots of tequila, was a false thing. And the new freedom, and I heard him do this either the last time we did this or the time before, and you didn't do it this time. The new freedom is a freedom from the only thing I've ever needed to be free from, and that's the bondage of self. And when I actually do this Ninth Step thing, that's what happens. And it says we will suddenly realize that God's doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. It doesn't say God will suddenly begin to do for us. He will have been doing for me for a long time. My realization will be sudden. I've had a couple of people approach me with a question. It's been the same question, so I want to talk about it for a minute. I sincerely believe that the numbers in front of the steps are important. And that it's important to take them in order. I think it's important to have a sponsor involved in amends. Uh, it, I've tried to make amends before I got a sponsor when I was new, and I devastated some people. That is a horrendous mistake. They're in order for a reason. The forgiveness process in step four is necessary before I go to make amends to people I have harmed if I currently hate them. If I still hate them and go to make amends to them, it can really be a mess. It can really be a mess. So I think it's so critically important to get through that forgiveness process that we talked about in step four before I get to step nine. And then at step nine that I'd be doing it uh, under the tutelage of a sponsor who has already done this himself. On page 84, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about step 10. And it's not that we don't have a lot more we can talk about the other steps. This is just we're going to, we're going to catch what we can. It says this thought cont- that brings us to step 10, page 84, which suggests we continue. Bill tried hard not to use the same word over and over again. He uses the word continue four times in this paragraph. We continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. For me, that differentiates step 10 from what I call the evening portion of step 11. Step 10 is about me being present in my own life moment by moment. If I wait until 11 o'clock at night to take inventory to notice that I screwed up at 7.15 in the morning, it takes promptly right out of it. So to me, step 10 is about being present in my own life uh, and being present all the time. And for me, there's a slogan that applies to that, and it's easy, does it? When I run Mach 2 with my hair on fire, I don't even know when I mess up. So I need to put the the two hardest things, two hardest assignments I've ever gotten are one day at a time and easy, does it? To back it all the way down to that. I got a friend that says he spends too much time in his head trying to clear away the wreckage of his future. (laughs) That hit. Yeah. So the short form of step 10, continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, probably admitted it. (laughs) No, I'm sorry. Wait, promptly, promptly admitted it. So I have to be present in my own life. So for me, step 10 is about being here with you as I go along. And it says we vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. We've entered the world of the Spirit. Want to know where you enter the world of the Spirit? You completed step 9. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. I don't think, now I'd be wrong, I'd love to be corrected on this, 
I, I don't think that they've asked me to understand a thing up until now. It hasn't been about understanding because I had to take out the trash first. I had to dig the poison out of my soul first. And I'd like to thank the lady. I don't know where she is. Somebody came and disagreed with something I'd said, and I've learned something. And I, um, It wasn't actually a disagreement, but a suggestion, and I appreciate that very much. I'm looking for people that disagree. I learned. Now it's time for me to begin to understand and to become effective. I can't do either of those until I get the poison dug out of my soul and find out who I really am. This is not an overnight battery. It should continue for a lifetime. Continue, it says, to watch for. Here's that list again. Selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. We talked about what those are. All the functions of self. If these crop up, no, when? This is not an if question. This is a when question. When these crop up, what do we do? Ask God to remove them. Discuss them with someone immediately. That would be spiritual advisor, sponsor, you know, somebody who's walked the path. Make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. And then sit down and beat myself up because I'm not perfect. Oh, wait, excuse me. That's not what that says. I can't find permission to beat myself up. And I think beating me up is never the next right thing because it blocks my learning process. Making mistakes doesn't do a thing for me. Realizing I've made a mistake always brings energy to me. And I used to use it beating me. I mean, really get angry with me and thrash around and kick things and all that. And, and, that ha and that, what that does, it blocks my learning process. Because I should use that energy to get focused on where did this mistake come from? What underlies it? What can I learn here? How can I be a better guy? Far, far a better way to use that. And then it says we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. There it is again. Same old prescription. Love and tolerance of others is our code. I want to tell a story. When I was sober about a year and a half, my home group started to form. And there, if, there were not, if there was one non-smoking meeting in the city of Nashville in 1985, I don't know where it was. Uh, it was smoking was so prevalent in the fellowship that in my home group, when you got a year, they gave you a Zippo lighter with your sobriety date on it <laughs> instead of a one-year chip. I've still got mine. Uh, a guy that I sponsor who has never smoked has still got his. And, but it was just highly unusual. So we started a non-smoking meeting in the back room of a clubhouse. And we would open with the, uh, the everybody else. They said, anybody who wants to have a non-smoking meeting, go in the back. And however many, four, five, six, or eight of us would go back there. And this one guy's name was Edward. And, and Edward would say, I'll chair. I thought, I'm going to strangle him. I just know I'm just, he, the world will be a better place when Edward is gone. <laughs> There's just not any question about it. And this guy just, he just frazzled me all the time. And I kept hearing people say, if you spot it, you got it. <laughs> and so one time I heard that. You, you, know, you know what a revelation is? A revelation is when I figure out for myself something you've been trying to tell me for six months or longer. <laughs> That's a revelation. You write that down if you want to. And, uh, and I realized that. And so I thought, okay, the next time Edward does something that bends me up, I'm going to search myself for it. Holy mackerel, I found it. And so the next time he did something that made me mad, I looked and I found it again. And I started following Edward around like a puppy. And I don't know if I was bending him up, but he was twisting me. And every time he did something that made me mad, I searched and found it. I don't know how much I learned from him, but it was a lot. I miss him. Because I learned so much. He had all my character defects. He had them much worse than I did. <laughs> That's not what he said. <laughs> Love and tolerance of others is our code. I tell you, sometimes if I have to tolerate somebody, maybe I better be. Somebody told me if everybody you meet stinks, you might want to shake your mustache. <laughs> you know, it just might be on me. Yeah, okay. And we've ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. The concept is so important, they tell us the same thing again at the bottom of page 103. No, 113. 103. In italics, after all, our problems were of our own making. There's the good news again. Bottles were only assembled. Besides, we have stopped fighting anybody or anything we have to. All right, just quit fighting them. That's part of the deal. It takes two to fight. Back on the bottom of 84, we've ceased fighting thing, anything and anyone, even alcohol, for by this time sanity will have returned. Where you get sanity? Do the first nine steps. Do the first nine steps. We promise you sanity. Now, for me, there are two kinds of sanity. There's sanity of action, which is the important one. And then there's sanity of mind, which I have most of the time. Um, 
My sponsor told me that in the history of this planet, no human has ever been put in an insane asylum for being insane. It has never happened. They put us in there for acting insane. And nobody's ever been let out for being sane. They let us out for acting sane. Right. So on those days when I developed this vital, again, necessary to life, vital sixth sense, I hope I can always have new ears. I hope I can always hear the new people. I, sp- I had 10 years when this guy had six months. And he and I were talking about this, that I was bringing him through the work one time. And he said this vital sixth sense. He said, I guess if I'm still using my other five senses to try to have my own will, I won't develop this vital sixth sense. Yeah. Wow. One of the, one of the most powerful. I, I wonder sometimes am I still on the path? I've had several of those big spiritual experiences. I just told you about one of them. I've had a couple of three. I guess I've had three. Um, I think the thing that tells me most that I'm on the path isn't those. It's the fact that I find things about me that need work, not things that are wrong with me. Discovering something else about me that needs work never feels good. Identifying the problem, though, is the first step toward fixing it. And, and the, the reason that this is evidence to me that I'm on the path is the day before I got to recovery, there was nothing wrong with me, thank you very much, and if you guppies would just shape up, this place would be just fine. And the fact that I'm finding things about me now that need work is not a cause for me to be sad or unhappy with myself. It is the clearest of all indications that I'm on the path. That was an important lesson for me. Um, My sponsor said prayer is not an opportunity to change God's mind. It's not a sales presentation. This is a chance for God to change your mind. I think he was right about that. I'm going to tell a story. Um, I have permission. Uh, I sponsor a young man we call Hippie James. Uh, Hippie James, was uh, he's a hippie that got born three generations too late. And um, t- today is his 24th birthday, and he's six or seven years sober. I'd have to look. Yeah. And he's, he's, in, he's in college. He's having a long, not terribly distinguished, but a long college career. And um, just a character of the first order. I guarantee you, when, he's, when Hippie James starts talking, my home group freezes because he is really carrying a message. And he told this story. He claims that there's a, uh, an outfit that makes, makes music and their name is Fish, but they spell it funny. I'm 65 years old. I'm willing to take his word for it. I don't really need to know. <laughs> and they were going to have their last concerts, what he said. I told him it was their first last concert because I've been watching these music guys for a long time. <laughs> and it was going to be up this way somewhere, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire. Did I get that right, New Hampshire? And it's, was it Vermont? Okay. And uh, so he's going to go. Nobody would go with him. So in Nashville, Tennessee, Hippie James gets into the Hippie Mobile, and he drives 32 hours nonstop to wherever this place is in Vermont to discover that the, the car line to get into the campground is another 10 hours. Yeah. And he's a whooped pup, and he's going to sleep behind the wheel, which is not a serious problem in a, in a parked car. The, the problem is that people are passing him, and this 10 hours of stretching. So he gets out of the hippie mobile, he pops the trunk, he pulls out the Coleman stove, he sets it up on the trunk of the hippie mobile. If you saw the hippie mobile, you wouldn't think much of that either. He fires it up and he's making coffee and he's making soup. And uh, he's, he's eating it, drinking the coffee, and he's sharing it with the people in the vehicles around him and talking to him. He said, because what I realized was that if I were going to stay physically awake, I was going to have to stay, spirit, uh, have to stay physically active. And then he said, if I'm going to remain spiritually awake... I'm going to have to remain spiritually active. Powerful. Page 156. Phenomenal amount of information in this one paragraph could go in many of the steps. I'm going to stick it in here. Paragraph in the middle of page 156. This is Bill and Bob, and they're only two sober. But life was not easy for the two friends. Plenty of difficulties presented themselves. Both saw that they must keep spiritually active. That's what Hippie James said. One day they called up a head nurse of a hospital. They explained their need. Did you hear that? Their need was to go and try to give this away. They had a need to go and do that. I think it's a powerful, powerful piece of information. Um, for, uh, for those who um, are hiding behind the fact that the steps are only suggested, we have good news and bad news. The good news is you're right. They're only suggested. The bad news, they're the only suggestions we got. (laughs) 
Yeah, we're, I'm going to get controversial again. We're, we're committing murder with the phrase. The phrase is don't drink and go to meetings. You'll die from that. That'll kill you. My sponsor asked it this way. He said if, a, if sitting around with a bunch of other alcoholics talking about our problems is going to get people sober, wouldn't the boys under the Woodland Street Bridge in Nashville, Tennessee, be sober tonight? Because that's who they are and that's what they're doing, and it doesn't work for them, and it doesn't work for us. Here are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. That's where it happens. I think the meetings are terribly important. My sponsor says, quite sincerely, he believes the program works better for people who do not drink between meetings. I I, I think it's a very good point. I think the not drinking part's important too. But the fact is that what I need is this spiritual awakening. And the way I get that is by actually doing these steps. Not learning them or believing them or interpreting, but actually doing them. That's the piece that changed my life. And that's what we're here to talk about. We'll go on with 10? Yep. Thanks, Scott. I'm Bob, still an alcoholic. This line has always struck me in the beginning of step 10 where it says, we have entered the world of the spirit. So somewhere in the first nine steps, something has happened to us. I, I noticed something all my life, and it used to aggravate me, and I never understood it, but there were guys and gals that I was in school with that I later worked on jobs with that I was involved in different areas with that for some reason these people everything they touched turned to gold their relationships were wonderful everybody loved them if they entered into a, any kind of art thing it just took off if they entered into business they did very well it's like they had the magic touch and their life was very their lives were very very successful and rich and full and happy and i'm miserable and i'm dying here and i've lost everything and i'm smarter than all those guys and it seemed really unfair to me it was almost as if they had something like maybe the day that they told everybody the secret I was sick that day at school, you know, or something. But they had something I didn't have. And what I think they had, and I've observed this in people since I've been sober that aren't in AA, is that they were in the realm of the spirit. I employed a lot of employees, and I had certain employees that weren't in a 12-step program. They weren't even involved in church, but yet they intuitively knew how to go with the flow and stay in the flow of life and to take care of people and love people. And it was just, that was just natural to them. They never, they never considered putting themselves first and their life worked and it worked really, really well. My daughter, I think is intuitively like that. I don't know what she just amazes me. There was a, a famous basketball game where, uh, Michael Jordan, at the very end of the game, it was tied, and he made a half-court shot right in, swish. The crowd went wild, and he's running. There's a famous shot of him running down the court, and everybody's on their feet screaming and yelling and cheering. He just won the game at the last second, and he just goes. And he was interviewed later, and they said, how did you do that? Under all that pressure, at the last moment, you made a half-court shot. That's impossible. How did you do that? And he said, he said, sometimes you get in the zone, and when you're in the zone, you can't miss. I think that's the realm of the spirit. I think also there was a time when alcohol got me in there. There was a time, and some of you remember this, if you're a salesman, there was a time when alcohol made you the best, really, and this is not an illusion, you were really the best salesman there was. There was a time, if you're a musician, or a, 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 that you played better than you ever played when you, were, when you had just enough alcohol. It freed your spirit, and you could go with a flow where everything just clicked. And then... Like a boomerang, it turned on us. Bill, Bill Wilson was really into boomerangs. If you ever go up to Stepping Stones, he has them all over the place, hanging in there. He loved the concept of something that could take to flight and then come back and turn on you. Right? And he, com- he, he used to compare it to alcohol. And he uses the analogy. It was like a boomerang that came back and turned on you. Uh, 
And when it turns on us, we lose that magic. And Alcoholics Anonymous is restoring it. It is putting us into the realm of the spirit where everything, if we can stay out of the way and let the power flow through us, everything just clicks. Just clicks. It works. This line in the middle of page 85 um, one point before we go into this. Why do we have to continue to do this? Uh, is it because God's not going to love us if we don't continue to clean house? Never. There's nothing I can do that would make God not love me. God never, ever, I don't know where this idea came into Christianity that's insane, that God punishes us for our sins. We're not punished for our sins, we're punished by them. We are never punished for them. And we all know that. We all know what we, we've always reaped what we sowed. We always reaped what we sowed. You can't escape that in that, uh, that truth. I had a long list of uh, people I hurt in my eight step list. And I tell you something, I never got away with anything. Every time I hurt somebody, whether conscious or unconscious, or even most of the time I didn't even know I was hurting you, I always paid a price for it in here. And I paid a price in my life. And if you would have seen, if you would have seen my life at the end and the accumulation of all the people I've hurt, you would have seen a guy who was punished by his sins. Severely. Severely. How bad does it have to be to stand on a bridge and sobbing trying to get up enough courage to kill yourself on page 85 it, it, the scott touched on this a little bit but i want to i want to talk take a minute and talk about it i think it's very important we lose we lose a lot of people here and we and when it says it's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels they're not kidding it's easy the, the problem with recovery from alcoholism through the 12 steps is it, it, it has in, within it good news and bad news. The good news is that over time, with the practice of this way of life, you become very comfortable and very happy and very successful to whatever level is right for you as a result of that. The bad news is you start to become comfortable and happy and successful. And when the monkey, it's, it's like the, the, there's that old saying goes around AA, the monkey may be off your back, but the circus is still in town. It's never changed. It, but it's so easy, when you're, it's so easy to make that trend, that incremental change of consciousness. It, it, when you're brand new, and you don't know if you have a place to live. You don't know if the people you care about are going to talk to you anymore. You don't even know if you've got a job. You're, you're so full of remorse and fear and depression and hopelessness. Man, you feel like you've got a bad case of alcoholism. How bad of a case of alcoholism do you feel like you got when you're five years sober and you got some money in your bank and all the amends are made and everything's going very well? Now you got pretty much everything you ever wanted. It's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action. It's so easy to get to a point where you feel like there's, re I know intellectually, yeah, yeah, there's a problem. I got alcoholism. Yeah, sure, I got alcoholism. But I don't feel like I have alcoholism anymore. And then what happens is often as we start to gradually, slowly, incrementally compromise a little action here, a little action there. Now I'm not going to eight meetings a week anymore. I'm going to three. Now I'm not calling my sponsor unless I get through something and just tell him what I did in case he ever needs that information. I don't really have time for service and 12-step work. Let the, let the newer people do that. Me and God are good. I don't have to ask. Ah, it's we're fine. I'm not a seeker anymore because uh, I think I've arrived. I never tell myself that consciously. But if you watch, if you watch the feet, and you want to know how you're doing, don't don't judge it by what you think or what you feel. Watch your feet. How do you act? Do I act 
like someone who is as committed to my recovery today as I was when I was new. I hope if you were to come to Las Vegas and follow me around for a week, you would come away with that. If for nothing else, you would come away with a sense that, boy, that Bob's got a bad case of alcoholism. You see all the crap he's got to do every week? I hope I look like somebody who's just as serious about this program as I was 30, 29 and a half years ago. Dr. Silkworth wrote an article on relapse that's stellar. If you ever get a chance to read it, it was in one of the first grapevines. And he compared uh, relapse from alcoholism to, to different other diseases. And the, the one I liked the most, he compared it to heart disease. It, it, certain types of heart disease are chronic, exactly like alcoholism. And one of these guys that gets, he'll have a heart attack. And all of a sudden, if he, he lives, they'll put him in the cardiac care unit and they'll stabilize him. And before they release him to go back home, they give him a program of action. And the program of action might be no salt, no fried foods, cut down on your meat, your dairy products, exercise, maybe take some medication if it's appropriate. And what happens is he gets out of the hospital and he starts following this because he's scared because he almost died. And what happens in no time at all because of the exercise and the diet, he starts feeling better than he's ever felt before in his whole life. And maybe a year and a half down the road, now maybe he's running five miles. He's out bowling one night with a bunch of guys that are younger to him, and he's looking at these guys, and he's out bowling, and he's thinking, you know, I'm in better shape than these guys are. And this place has a has is noted for their cheeseburgers, and he's watching them eat those cheese. He loves cheeseburgers. He's watching them eat those cheeseburgers, and they're juicy, and, they're, and they look really good, and he's thinking, I'm in better shape than all these guys. How come I can't have a cheeseburger? How come I need to go to so many meetings? How come I need a sponsor? How come I need to help others? And all of a sudden he says, give me a cheeseburger. And he eats a cheeseburger. And the worst thing that could ever happen happens. Nothing. <laughs> and a little key turns in his head. Right? A little key turns in his head. When they say alcoholism, cunning, baffling, powerful, it's also patient. And then all of a sudden, gradually, he starts compromising his actions. And then one day out of nowhere, out of nowhere, a thousand-pound weight slams him in the chest. If he's lucky enough to survive it, he ends up in a cardiac care unit. They're showing him Father Martin movies and stuff, and they're all that crazy <laughs> stuff. Man. And they give him another program of recovery, and he's back to square one. We lose a lot of people like this. It's tied into a delusion that it talks about in Chapter 3 that is why we lose people that are sober 10, 15, 20 years. It says the delusion that we are like other people. And the chapter is called more about alcoholism, so that must mean people don't have alcoholism. The delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe like, you know, after 10 years has to be smashed. Alcoholism is not something you can ever get over. If you have this chronic, permanent disease of alcoholism, you will always live in the shadow of it. You can live a tremendous life, provided you keep in fit spiritual condition and you do certain things every day. Just like the diabetic can live a great life, watches his blood sugar, his diet, exercise, medication, does everything he's supposed to do. There's a, in the, in the next paragraph, there's, there's something that it's, it's, I find interesting. It says, Scott touched on us a little bit. We have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. To some extent, we've become God conscious. I've, after I came to believe in God, I've been, I've been God unconscious. I think most of my relationship with God has been theoretical. It's, it's like when you're, when you're driving in your car, uh, you have an unconscious sense, and you know, you have faith that there, there are cops out there. You know there's cops out there. 
When you got one in your rear view mirror with his lights on, you have a conscious contact with <laughs> this is no longer theoretical. It's a conscious contact. And a lot of my relationship with God is like, I know he's there. But it's not a conscious contact. And then every once in a while, I get moments. And you know when the moments come? They're not usually through prayer and meditation. They're usually when I'm helping another drunk. Bill in his story says something. He says, unless the alcohol, if the alcoholic fails to enlarge his spiritual life through two things, and it's not prayer and meditation. It's self-sacrifice and constant work with others. If the alcoholic does not, if fails to enlarge his spiritual life through those two things, it says he'll never survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. We are doing all of this, I believe, so we can serve our primary purpose and stop serving ourselves. I think that's the point. The, the problem with, I, I, I tell you one quick little story, and I'll shut there, I had this friend who ran a casino in Vegas. I sponsored him for a while. And he told me about all the employees they caught stealing from him. And he said something, and this helped me in my business a little bit. He said, you'd be surprised the most honest, other-centered, caring, principled people in the world will, will steal from you if they can tell themselves it's not for them. It's for my kids. It's for my wife. It's for my family. And they will justify it. They wouldn't steal if it was just for them. But they'll do it to justify. The problem with my wife my kids, my friends, my family, is the word my. <laughs> it's the word my. It's just an extension of self. That's why in Alcoholics Anonymous, we're so big on helping strangers. I, every once in a while, you, you probably run into guys that say, well, can't I do just do 12-step work in my house? The problem is it's your family. It's self-serving. The magic only happens when I am giving of myself unconditionally and there's no chance of profit, motive, or self-grandizement. There's no self-promotion here. There's nothing I can get out of it. I'm really doing, as Chuck Chamberlain said, for fun and for free, period. Alcoholics Anonymous is at its best when it's lived for fun and for free. I'm not an advocate of, of profiting from AA. I, I, th I know people that do it. I don't know how they survive it. I don't think you can take where you're supposed to give. I, I must always be in a giver's position in Alcoholics Anonymous. I try to keep all the aspects of self out of it. It's a full, if you got the ego that I got, that's a full time job because <laughs> it's just clamors to me all the time. Do you ever see, if you've ever seen the movie Two Towers, the second Lord of the Rings, there's a scene in there where King Theoden is sitting on his throne and there's this character called Wormtongue, and Wormtongue sits right next to him and just clamors in his ear. <laughs> clamors to say, well, don't, well, you, well, sire, don't listen to them. They just, they just clamors. And my ego's like that. Uh, it never goes away. It clamors to me all the time. And it's always about me. It's always about me. My stuff. A couple of things we'll call it a ball okay. game. Okay. A gift from my sponsor. Don't let the things that AA brings you take you away from AA. That's a pearl right there. Don't let the things that AA brings to you take you away from AA. Someone asked Miss Linda one time what she thought about all the time I spend doing meetings in jails. I'm rather involved in that. She said, I love it because I love who he is when he comes out of there. And the ones where, where, where they work the most, the ones that, that I get the most out of are the ones where I don't want to go. My team is playing on TV tonight, and I got the jail commitment. And I don't want to go. I walk around the house telling her I don't want to go. She never even responds because she knows I'm going. Because that's the night that I come out of there a foot off the ground with tears running down my face. Because I know that I've been a tool in the master's hand in somebody's life. And I, I share an experience that I had a number of years ago. I've had it more than once, but this is the first one. I'm sitting in a little restaurant in Nashville having lunch, minding my own business. And this guy walks up to my table and he says, you don't remember me, do you? 
And I said, Mr., I apologize if I should. I don't know you. He says, you came into a prison I was in a few years ago, and you spoke, and I heard you, and I believed you. And I'm doing what you said, and I'm never going to be incarcerated again in my whole life. And I would like to thank you for my freedom. And I'm overpaid for the rest of my life. I'm overpaid for the rest of my life. I, uh, I thought for the longest time that I owed this tremendous debt of gratitude to the men that carried this message to me, my, my sponsors and some other people. Page 124 says that's not right. This is powerful, powerful stuff. This painful past may be of infinite value to other families still struggling with their problem. We think each family which has been relieved owes something to those who have not. I don't owe it to them. I got here with dead eyes. Do you ever meet a newcomer with dead eyes? And you start working with them and you get them into this thing and all of a sudden one day the lights are on. Right? I didn't turn them on, but I was involved and I knew I was a tool in God's hand. And there's nothing that touches that. And those guys that carried this message to me, they got to see the light come on in my eyes. They're overpaid. They were a tool in God's hand and they know it. And they're overpaid. I owe them nothing. The reason this debt can't be repaid is I owe it to the next newcomer that shows up to my home group. That's where the debt's owed. I owe it to the guys that are in prisons and jails in my city. That's where I owe the debt. And that's why it can never be repaid. Anything else? No. If you all don't mind, remain seated. Um, We're going to have a few moments of silence. And we're going to whisper the Lord's Prayer. Don't miss tomorrow morning. Kind of gently. Yeah, we the... uh, The The sessions that I enjoy the most of what Bob and I do are the next two. We save the best stuff for last. I'm not kidding. Um, We'll have a few moments of silence. We'll whisper the Lord's Prayer. We'll have a few moments of silence after that. Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. God bless us all. We'll see you in the morning.